The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Four ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground and still on the ground. Picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. Alabama back on top of the college football world. gentlemen football to the max your host sean garmer gary vaughn and randy isbell hello and welcome to another football to the max the nfl week eight preview edition and of course i'm your host sean garmer and with me back randy isbell yeah i'm so glad that i decided to come back when the NFL gave us the Jaguars and the Titans on Thursday night for the 37th straight year. <laughs> and they boy, thought, did they, repetition. Just, boy, did they not repetition disappoint. Either. It's awful. It's just, the NFL this year has made no sense. And, you know, yes, it's parody. And yes, you know, we're getting, it's going to be really a big cluster come week 16 and 17 for the playoffs, but the product is so awful. And thank God that the the day in between world series games, the NFL gets to showcase such a masterpiece. (laughs) Gary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a game that, uh, that we have to see every year, I guess, and that makes uh, repetition uh, normal, I guess, in the NFL, um, which is sad because they always try to be parody and they always try to be different, but yet they still do the same things. Okay, so uh, but at the see end of the day, cool light blue jerseys against those ugly ass, like almost uh, turd stain jerseys the Jacksonville Jaguars <laughs> wear. I don't. Well, you know what. <laughs> The the Jaguars this year deserve to be in those turd stained jerseys because they are the Arizona State this year for me. Where I just I bought into the hype. I really thought they were going to take the huge steps forward. You know, we were worried about if they're going to be able to take that next step on defense. They took three steps back on offense. This was the first time we even saw the junk time Jaguars. They hadn't been able to do that this season. Right like here. Blake Bortles at least scores a couple touchdowns in the second half. If you're a fantasy owner, that's wonderful, but it's awful. And the only thing that I can take away from this game, other than people need to start believing in me with home team on Thursday night, especially when they're junk, is Gus Bradley will be the first coach fired in the NFL. He has taken all of this young talent and done nothing with it. Not only that, but uh, also the uh, DeMarco Murray Derrick Henry tandem. That is something to believe in as well. They were terrific in this game. Both of them were went off. They literally the Titans just ran all over the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's what happened in the game. They just ran all over them. That did. I mean, yes, they passed. And the and the best stat was like they were. I don't know how many times they converted on third down, but they had like over 150 yards when they converted on third down. It's like literally about a third of their yards are converting on third down against you. I mean, seriously, how bad are you? That third and 13 that they convert from like their own end zone, I mean, that was it after that. It was like, okay, the Jaguars just gave up at this point. Just why am I still watching this? 
Tennessee gave up too. I mean, I think they could have done even more. They just kind of slowed down and stopped, you know, being so aggressive. I mean, I just really felt like that that was the case, and I respect, you know, they don't want to get anybody hurt. Just play it smart. Uh, and you're right, Sean. At the end of the day, all they had to do was run the ball, but you know, at the end, you know, they still got some great, uh, you know, showcasing of a, you know, Marcus Mariota. So I was happy for overall with Tennessee. That's who I picked in this game. Jacksonville, you know, Randy was great. It's in a, such a sad situation. I talked about this on a Monday show. This division was all about being young, being better, and I think a lot of us chose this to be one of the better divisions of football, and it ends up being one of the worst and we all pick the nfc east to be in the tank and they're all winning very odd yeah what's sad is that all of the these teams could equal i mean except for the jaguars they could all be four and four i mean it's just that tells you i think everything you need to know right there Mm -hmm. a three-way tie for if things go right Man, and we thought this was going to be the sexy division this year. Not the case. Not. We all had we we all had beer goggles in March. Just believe it. Just we're terrible. Yeah. Well, uh, another team that could, both two teams that could also wind up four and four depending on results here. Uh, in London, the Washington Redskins taking on the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh... You know, the Bengals kind of came to, had a little bit more like the Bengals kind of game last week, but it was against the Browns, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. Uh, Not that the Redskins' defense is, like, totally scary or anything. Uh, I still got to feel like I can go with the Bengals. It's just, when you get to London, it's like whatever scenario you think works, it just don't happen. Most of these games are terrible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what's going to be worse, a Thursday night game or, or the London game? When we looked at the London game last week and the Giants and the Rams just made everyone in England go, soccer has so much more scoring than this. This is just, what is this? And I, I think we're going to see a little bit of that here. I'm going to take Cincinnati in this game, uh, but I'm a little hesitant now with the news that both um, Jordan Reed and Josh Norman have been cleared to travel with the team, which is a, a good sign for them. I've liked how Washington has looked, you know, winning four straight before, you know, letting Matt Stafford have the the late drive against them to come back and win that game, and which was a great last what five minutes of that game. That was enjoyable to watch. Um, but you know, they they look now to turn things back and. And listen, Washington is a big fan favorite in England. Uh, England became a big, you know, getting into the NFL a bit in the late 80s. That's when the Redskins were great. Uh, so they're kind of the Dallas Cowboys of England where, you know, a lot of bandwagoners jumped on that and kind of stuck with it. But I'm taking Cincinnati here. I do think that just all around they're the better team. It was nice to see Jeremy Hill get things going a bit. Again, yes, it was the Browns. Um, but just all in all, I think they have the better defense. I think you can run on Washington. So give me Cincinnati. You know, I think you can run on Washington. But if I am Washington, I'm terrified of A.J. Green. And, yes, you got Josh Norman on that Redskins team. Guess what? Guy doesn't travel doesn't travel very often at all. And so that means AJ Green is going to line up everywhere you, he can find a, a path. Uh, he's going to do it, and they're going to make sure that they find him any way possible. You got, you know, a possibility of Tyler Eifert joining this offense again. Um, I just, I look at this, and I think Kirk Cousins is not going to have easy as a task as it may look. Uh, Cincinnati's defensive front is still pretty darn good. Yeah, sure, they've not done as greatest years past i still think they're good so i'm going cincinnati all right so we all pick cincinnati there and randy's new york jets uh after geno smith 
suffered his torn ACL and everybody wept and then was okay two seconds later. Uh, taking on the winless Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. So how do you feel about the Fitzpatrick tantrum? It's a joke. It's irritating. It. I just didn't understand it. Listen, you got your job back. You were awful in the, in the first few games this season. Just completely awful. Yes, I have defended Fitzpatrick a few times on this podcast before I'm on, going on my sabbatical that a lot of his interceptions came in junk time and they were trying to force the ball. But he was also forcing the ball in the red zone, which would create any kind of a comeback just useless. And that was been the kind of the problem with Fitzpatrick this year. You know, he was looking for the big contract. The Jets wouldn't give it to him. No other team would give it to him. So they went, all right, here, we'll give you one year. You show us what you got, and then we'll go from there. And I think he's forcing it. I think, you know, he has put too much pressure on his shoulders. And that kind of came out in that interview where he was saying, listen, the coach doesn't believe in me anymore, and the owner doesn't. It, it's kind of him just going, it's me against the world. And that's, I think, his mentality this whole season, and it's completely backfired. Um, I am disappointed that Geno Smith got hurt. I actually thought he looked really well, it looked really good in that first half before getting hurt against Baltimore. Looked a little skittish in the pocket at times, but it, you know his, his arm strength is just so much better. So it's interesting to see. I I I do think that the next few weeks will be interesting for the Jets. Uh, they they go here to Cleveland, which obviously is a nice matchup for them. Then they go to Miami, which is a tough divisional matchup, but I don't think Miami's anything special. And then they host the Rams, who have kind of been falling apart. And at this point, they could have Goff at their quarterback. So there's a, a chance that the Jets can reel off three more straight wins and go into their bye week five and five. And then you go from there. I mean, you know, Patriots right after that and a few other games that they could win. So they're not completely out of the playoffs yet, uh, mathematically, but they have to win these next three. I, I think if they lose one or two of these after the bye week is when you're going to see one of the young quarterbacks as they start looking for next year. Both Fitzpatrick and Geno Smith not under contract next year, so they will kind of see how things go from there. As far as Cleveland, what a disappointment. I mean, they're going to have Josh McCown come back, which is probably one of their better options, but... Uh, have they even had the same quarterback start back-to-back weeks this year? It's just just so disappointing for them on top of the defense being awful. So I, I have the Jets in this game, but oh, the quarterback situation, it's it's not good. Yeah, it's a headache, and I, you know, can understand that problem. Uh, you know, uh, my team dealt with that for years and years. And here's the thing. I, I think that at the end of the day, You've got to give the New York Jets every opportunity to be successful. Right now, Fitzpatrick is that. Yes, I know issues. Randy just pointed them all out. Um, But until they're mathematically out of it, until you really know that there's really no shot, there's no reason to get ahead of yourself. And, you know, I think that this is a game that they can use to maybe springboard a little bit. Maybe go in here and get your confidence up. Maybe, you know, take care of business handedly. Don't let Cleveland start to, you know, sneak in the game. Just shove their face in the dirt. Say, we're the New York Jets. We push people around. No one pushes us around. Get that confidence back, and maybe your team can do something down the line. And we've seen this happen. You know, there have been teams that have, you know, come out of nowhere. Uh, This is about the time when uh, we saw some... Teams do this not long ago. I think uh, I heard the stat the other day, and I can't remember. I'm sorry, but I think there was three to four teams, I believe, last year, maybe the year before, that were at this point that were losing, had losing records, had only won like two games, and came back and finished very strong. New York's not out of that realm of possibility. So I, I think I got, though, New York here. I feel like somebody was listening to us when we talked about this same scenario, Gary. That the Jets could go five and five, even if they lost to the Patriots, they still got a nine, another nice string of games after that, and then you just got to beat the Patriots at least once, and you might still be in some playoff contention, or, or you know, at least have a good record. 
uh, going into that offseason, whichever works out for the Jets. I mean, so, yeah, you're totally right. Not out of it yet. Maybe you feel like you have to play Fitzpatrick right now, and that's fine. Uh, on the other side, Cleveland Browns wish they could be playing Cody Kessler right now because he's actually looked good, and then he gets hurt, and then you're left with Kevin Hogan. The guy actually got 100 yards of rushing in the last game. But, you know, Josh McCown is their best option when they didn't know that Kessler was going to be what he is. And, you know, it, perhaps Cleveland will actually be formidable, even without the Joe Hayden and the other defensive players that they're missing because – that's one thing McCown gives them is he makes them a, a team that you have to you have to be careful about because he's he's a whether he's gonna run away or he's gonna throw the ball downfield to get it done. I still got the Jets here though, regardless. Uh, the Detroit Lions, uh, who have been w- on winning ways here, travel to Houston to take on the Texans. He. Uh, there is a GoFundMe currently so that they can take out Rock Osweiler's contract. <laughs> yeah, I put $20 in on that. <laughs> you oh would. Boy. You would. What a turd. Just an awful quarterback. I shut that. <laughs> oh, damn. He's, this is coming from a Jets fan. Osweiler's a terrible quarterback. All right. It's just... It's awful, and and the the sad thing is he has a good team around him. Uh, I'm a little suspect on the offensive line, and that could be also part of the reason that Osweiler is having issues. Uh, watching Monday Night Football, I believe it was Gruden had a wonderful point that that really stuck with me. Is Osweiler is what six six? Mm-hmm. There's not many really tall quarterbacks like that in the, in the NFL because it takes them so long to get the ball off. You know. Just, you know, by physics, it takes them a while to throw the ball. So if your offensive line doesn't give you that little bit of extra time, it's a, a lot more likely that, you know, you're going to get it interrupted. You're going to not get it off the way it is. Also, the secondary is going to be able to uh, read what you're doing a bit faster. We saw that a lot on Monday where Osweiler would try to throw it and realize that his option was now gone and try to stop. It didn't always work the way he wanted. Uh, So there's just some things that are are completely amiss for Houston offensively. Defensively, they're not bad, but I just like the way Detroit's playing. Stafford is just having a monster year. The Jim Bob Cooter effect has definitely worked this season. Um, Not getting the wins that they were hoping, but I think they get the win here on the road. Give me the Lions. And the thing with the Lions, too, is... They'll commit turnovers, which falls right in the hands of Mr. Brock Osweiler. Uh, which, I mean, it's even helped them win some of these games. So I'm going to go with the Lions, even though they are uh, traveling to Houston. You know what's funny? You just mentioned this thing about the, the Brock Osweiler. I meant to touch about on this on the, the Thursday game, but I don't remember anyone talking about Blake Borders release last year. Now everybody is talking about how he brings the ball down and then takes forever to throw the ball. So crazy what losing will do to what people talk about you. But uh, go Mm -hmm. ahead, Gary. No, it it is very much the truth. And, you know, Brock Eisweiler, we were all suspect of him coming out of Denver. You saw the fact that Peyton Manning came in, finished for, for the Super Bowl, even though he wasn't very good. You know, it was that defense that won. So saying all that, I really felt like when the Houston Texans spent that much money, they were hoping on a prayer that this guy was something. They didn't know. They didn't have enough on him. They just had just enough to know that you know he can at least quarterback a team to an average offense with an ex- excellent defense. That's what they knew. They figured they had an excellent defense, J.J. Watt and company. They could do the same thing in Houston. Well, J.J. Watt, uh, that defense isn't working out the way that they plan. And offense isn't working out the way they planned either. Osweiler's not good. This affects this team. I believe they're going to win in a situation where no one's believing in their quarterback. It, it's tough. I, I feel bad for them because they put themselves in this big hole. Fair enough. Uh, 
now we move on to another team in that AFC South. Uh, in Indianapolis, the Kansas City Chiefs travel. And now this is one of those where, like, you don't know what to make of it because Andrew Luck can always go off at home and it uh, doesn't matter how good the defense is. So you got to worry about that. Um, but this is Kansas City, and they their defense has been improving, and Alex Smith is Alex Smith. Uh, this is a tough one for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the Chiefs. Randy. Yeah, I'm. Uh, go ahead, Randy. Well, I'm still deciding, so you go right ahead. I, I, okay, so I, I look at this matchup and I think to myself, okay, okay, so the Chiefs are, you know, a good team. They're not the best team out there. They're, they're, I, I look at them as a team that has a decent de- defense, that has an offense that can be really good. And so that brings me at about average for them. And I know it sounds kind of a cop-out. But I am no uh, believer in them than I was earlier in this year. So saying in this matchup, what I really believe, well, what I do believe is the fact that they're not going to have to worry too much because I think their defense is going to be good enough to beat Andrew Luck. I really feel like Kansas City has that power. They showed last week they can pass the ball down the field. The Colts are going to try to do that, but I don't know. I believe in the Kansas City offense more than I do the Colts defense. Kansas City's definitely looked better recently, you know, beating New Orleans and Oakland, almost losing that game to, to New Orleans. They almost wanted to lose that. You look at Indianapolis this year, and they've just, to me, they've underachieved. They were supposed to take this big step forward. Uh, they barely beat, they hold on and beat the Titans last week. They lost to Brock Osweiler and the Houston Texans. They barely beat the Bears. Uh, they lost to Jacksonville. So, you know, they've struggled a bit, but all of these games are extremely close. Uh, all of them w- within a score. Actually, every game they've played except for at Denver has been within a score this season. So they like these close games. Kansas City, I don't see this being any different. I see it being less than a touchdown. Uh, and I just think in the Dome in Indianapolis, give me Andrew Luck to make a big drive late. Uh, I do think Kansas City is the better team and will probably go farther this season. But on this week, I think Andrew Luck gets it done. Give me the Colts. Another team that obviously got better once they got their quarterback back. Tom Brady and the Patriots going into Buffalo, who's been a tricky team. And, of course, Buffalo, the team that beat them already. Of course, different quarterback. Uh, I think Tom Brady is going to be rather... Wanting to just absolutely take the Bills down and not get beat by them twice. Don't want to give Rex Ryan that satisfaction. Yeah, I'm going to go with yeah. the Patriots here. Yeah, uh, and you know, Bill Belichick is not happy with the way that the game ended last time. You know, being shut out at home. That's a tough thing. And I know he's not used to that kind of defeat and being treated like that. I don't think he's going to let his players forget it either. I think the Buffalo Bills are preparing for war. Uh, they've already said that they're not going to let the Patriots run to their sidelines and do kind of what Brissett did last time that they matched up. Saying all that, I know the Bills are going to be on fire. They're going to be ready to play this game. I, I don't think, you know, no matter how on fire you are, if Tom Brady is upset and you got Belichick upset and they're ready to win, they're going to win. I, I just... I don't know if you got any motivation that can beat theirs. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting game, uh, especially as you guys said with Buffalo winning the first game uh, with Tom Brady not on the field, and the fact that the Bills have not swept the Patriots the century. Uh, I, I do think that sticks that way. I have New England here, possibly no Lashawn McCoy for Buffalo, and even if he plays, how much does he play? Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Gilchrist as far as you know being the lead back there in Buffalo, and that really puts too much pressure on Tyrod Taylor, who I will say, you know, since they did fire their offensive coordinator, and all, we all made fun of him because you know it was because of the defense that they lost to the Jets, and it, you know everything kind of turned around after that. Tyrod Taylor has played better. I really think that they focused on the run more. 
Um, but that is very dependent on a healthy LaShawn McCoy. And New England really does a wonderful job of shutting down what you're good at. So I really think they contain Tyrod Taylor in this game. Tom Brady has way too many weapons to choose from, and none of them are even a wide receiver other than Edelman. I mean, just all the tight ends and running backs that he dumps it down to. I, I have New England here. Yeah. Uh, no doubt on, on that. So we uh, move on to a, a team that has been wonderful on the road, and they get to go on another road game. The Oakland Raiders undefeated when traveling away from home. They're just getting ready to go to Las Vegas. So that's what they're doing. Yes. And uh, Tampa Bay, who's been on and off this year, they got lucky and beat the Carolina Panthers. And then they somebody had to win that 49ers game. And so we get to this, and I feel like the Raiders are just ready to come in and maul them some Buccaneers. Yeah, and the Buccaneers are, you know, a team that really has struggled um, pretty badly. You know, Winston's done okay himself. If you look at fantasy, even, uh, you know, Mike Evans, but... Over team wise, they've had a lot of ups and downs, and uh, more downs than ups. So, I look at Oakland. I, I like Oakland's offense in this game. I think they're going to have a pretty good game. Latavius Murray could even have some uh, success here. I had it's not it's not going to be a blowout game. Trust me. I think Tampa Bay is going to hold their own, but I really feel like Oakland's going to be too much. Yes, Oakland loves to play on a field that doesn't have a baseball diamond on it. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, they, as Sean said, they're four zero on the road already this season. Another long trip for them to the East Coast to play an early game. I, I think it starts to take a little bit of effect to go, you know, all the way to Jacksonville, and I believe they went back. They may have stayed on the East Coast. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And then all the way back to Tampa Bay. It makes for a long week. Again, as I said with the Indianapolis thing, I do think Oakland is a much better team. But something sneaky about this this Tampa Bay team, yes, they snuck by on that win with Carolina and San Francisco's awful. But I think they're starting to kind of fill their groove. You know, They've had a lot of injuries that they've had to deal with, and they're, now they're getting things figured out. And the funny thing is, you have all these injuries and they're replacing them with guys who I'm now completely blanking on the head coach's name for Tampa Bay, but he used to be in Atlanta and they're just Derek filling Cutter. them in with Derek Cutter. Thank you. They're just filling them in with old Atlanta guys and they're working great. Jacques Rogers is amazing in the backfield lately. And I think he's a step up for, from Doug Martin. So I think they're starting to get a little bit of a groove. So I'm going to take the minor upset. I'm going to take the Buccaneers. All right. Interesting. Those are always good to keep track of for later. And New Orleans at home taking on the Seattle Seahawks. Ooh. Man. This, because New Orleans is a different team when they play at home. Uh, you always got to be weary of them. Uh, revenge game for Jimmy Graham. He gets to come back to his old stomping grounds here. I would be wouldn't be surprised if Jimmy Graham actually had a pretty big day. I think Russell Wilson kind of gets back in the flow of things here when he doesn't have a defense that's going crazy pressuring him. Uh, I'd say it's Seahawks win. I will say that uh, it will not be a six six tie. Um, I, it might be six six after the first four minutes. I do think a lot of points will be scored in this game. Uh, it being in New Orleans. Listen, Seattle's a good team. Uh, they struggled a little bit off and on. Russell Wilson is still trying to get healthy here, but I'm going to take the Saints at home. Drew Brees is just too good. And a lot of these revenge games, you know, you start focusing on one player and you kind of miss the point. Uh, so I agree. I think Jimmy Graham has a decent game uh, fantasy wise, but uh, I'm taking the Saints. Yeah. And, you know, the Saints are a good team. They really are. They've had a lot of success despite the fact that they've had some trouble in their offensive line protecting Russell Wilson. He's been, you know, kind of banged up, but I really don't fear this New Orleans defense. I feel like the Seattle is going to slow down Drew Brees and it'll be a victory for Seattle. 
All right. Uh, another game that is... <clears throat> this is a revenge game for the whole team. <laughs> the Arizona Cardinals, who lost to the Carolina Panthers last year in the playoffs. Uh, Carolina coming off the, perhaps just a terrible, terrible uh, last many weeks here, looking to right the ship against an Arizona Cardinals team who, well, they just came off that 6-6 tie <laughs> with the Seahawks. Uh, and this could be another one of these 6-6 ties. <laughs> the Panthers' defense isn't what they were last year. I'm joking, but uh, eh, I got the Cardinals here. I think they're gonna wind up again. The Panthers don't have a way to stop anybody at this point, and I have more faith in the Cardinals' defense stopping Cam Newton. Yeah, I, I definitely have faith in the Cardinals' defense. Uh, I do like the matchup between Patrick Peterson and Kelvin Benjamin. I think that will be very entertaining to watch. I think. If this was just a normal week in Arizona, I might agree with you and take the Cardinals. But listen, Carson Palmer has not been the same since that playoff game. He has just been dreadful this season. Uh, Michael Floyd has been non-existent on this team. The deep pass has not been there. If it wasn't for David Johnson, I think you're looking at the most disappointing team in the league here with the Cardinals and not the Panthers Panthers coming off a bye week. Look for them to bounce back finally. Uh, you know, they've, they've, they have been focused on turning the season around, and this is their week to do it. Give me the Panthers. Yeah, I look at the Panthers as a team that, sure, they've come off a bye. They feel like that they you know need to get things turned around. But I look at Arizona, and they're pissed off. And they've had a tough week, and sure, maybe that could lead to them getting a little bit unfocused. But I think they're going to come into this game, and I think they feel like they can compete with Carolina. And I think that they're ready to prove a point, and to not only that, but get some revenge. So I feel more comfortable with Arizona right now. I'm still concerned about that Carolina defense, and I don't think that they're going to be able to do what they did last year to Arizona. Uh, well, the, this is a, I swear we just saw these two teams play each other. Uh, that's cause they just did. And that was the first time the San Diego Chargers actually won a game. And I don't think they're going to get that lucky twice though. Uh, I think Denver's going to come in. It's it mile high. Uh, they got Trevor Simeon back. He's, uh, back to himself. I think, uh. The Broncos are going to win this one. The the defense is going to buckle down on Philip Rivers this time. Well, the the main question for me in this game is: It does Denver come out and blow them out, or does San Diego go back to their we have to find a weird way to lose the game that they had earlier in the season? I, I saw something, and I almost kind of agree with it. This is one of the best three and four teams that I think I've seen in a while. San Diego's actually really impressed me with how they've been able to stick in games. Uh, I, I really thought this was going to be a down year for the Chargers. And, you know, it still might be. But the defense is playing better than I thought they were. Phillip Rivers is getting things done. Melvin Gordon's finding the end zone. Uh, so through all of the injuries, you know, they've been able to get things done. But, you know, the last time they played Denver, it was against Paxton Lynch. I think Simeon is a step up right now, uh, so give me Denver at home. Yeah, I got Denver at home as well. I feel like that they've got the opportunity and the upper hand here. Uh, it is a bummer about C.J. Anderson. Uh, I feel I felt like C.J. Anderson was kind of giving them, uh, you know, a lot more help than people gave him credit for. But I think you know they're going to continue on, and Booker is going to do his job and. I don't know. I look at this as a game, but the San Diego Chargers aren't going to be able to catch lightning in a bottle twice. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what Devontae Booker can do because he hasn't really done a whole lot when he has had the touches uh, so far this season. So now it's him. Is Ronnie Hillman still there? Him and uh, him and Ronnie Hillman. And then we get the uh, big Fox... <clears throat> Four o'clock game here. The Green Bay Packers going to the Georgia Dome to take on <clears throat> the Atlanta Falcons. Hello. Sorry. 
Uh, <laughs> throat clear there. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, going to be really uh, – this should be a, a great game, hopefully. Yes. Uh, Matt Ryan should be putting up some points. Aaron Rodgers putting up some points. Uh, I'm going to go with the Falcons. Uh, before I get to that game, uh, according to ESPN's roster, it's Capri Bibbs is the other running back for Denver. <laughs> you're not you're not going to find any analysis on Capri Bibbs here on this podcast, um, but that's your guy. This one is really interesting just for the fact that I'm still not sure what I've seen from either of these teams are real. Green Bay continues to struggle offensively, obviously losing Eddie Lacy and using Ty Montgomery, the wide receiver, at running back and, you know, making that work against Chicago. Uh, We will kind of see how, you know, that gets added in. You know, now is Davis now with an extra week on the team. Does he feature more for this team or not? Uh, Jordy Nelson's really struggled. And and the fact is, I've watched a lot of Green Bay this year because I, my girlfriend is a Packers fan, so we sit and watch a lot of them. I have never seen a quarterback, especially with the talent of Aaron Rodgers, have so much time in the pocket because teams have just figured out that you know they don't have much of a running game, period, especially now that they don't really have much as far as running backs go. If they just drop everyone back in coverage, they know that most of their receivers, you know, are not going to create separation, and they just make him sit there and wait until he finally has to force something. It's like he has six, seven seconds every time he drops back, and then finally has to force it in because nobody's getting open. Atlanta has a sneaky defense, but I, I just can't take them. I, I, I still have that that inkling in my head that Green Bay is so much better than they've shown. Atlanta has been great, but last year they started out great and fell apart. I'm not saying they fall apart yet, but I do think Green Bay gets the win. I will say this, too. It also seems like uh, Rodgers is so used to like throwing with the pressure last year that maybe like, he doesn't even know what to do with the fact that he has so much time now. It's it's ab- You're absolutely true. You go and, and watch – any of these games this year and and it's actually my girlfriend that pointed it out and you know it's something i watch every now from now on is he draws back and like i said he has all the time in the world but he is never comfortable in the pocket he is bouncing around like there's seven people running after him so i think you're right he's usually just tr- one of those guys there's a lot of pressure and he's getting the ball off quick that he's bouncing around and, and just you know, getting too excited and then making the wrong decision. So I think you're 100 percent right on that. Gary, yeah. Uh, looking at this matchup, I really kind of feel like, um, really, I mean, it's going to come down to how Matt Ryan plays. You know, uh, that's the way I kind of feel because if Matt Ryan's hot and the Atlanta defense is even able to do kind of what Randy said, and that's put enough defensive backs out there, make the, you know, the whole field muddy when it comes to the passing game. I think that the Falcons are going to have a really good shot at winning this game. Now, if Matt Ryan's in this game a little flat, gives Aaron Rodgers too many opportunities, I think that could be a quick fail. But if you ask me, my gut's telling me to go with Atlanta, that's going to go with. But I still... Confidence isn't real high on that, but I still feel that I could win this game. Yeah, and then uh, we'll skip the big Sunday matchup for a second, and we'll go to the Monday night Halloween terror that is uh, the guy that sort of looks like a cross between the Wolfman and Frankenstein and Sam Bradford going against the Chicago Bears. Uh, Minnesota... You know, didn't look themselves against the Eagles. They, uh, the Eagles made them uh, have to deal with interceptions, forcing turnovers. Sam Bradford looked more like the Sam Bradford of last year. The Bears aren't that team, though, even though the Vikings' offensive line is really depleted, and that's a problem. Uh, uh, they do get Jay Cutler, but the reason why I can't pick the Bears is because it's Jay Cutler. 
and it's also because the Bears usually don't play well at home either. So I'm going to go with the Vikings, but geez. Uh, the Bears don't play well at home. They don't play well on the road. They don't play well on Halloween or Thanksgiving or Sunday or Monday or Thursday or you just name it. The Bears are awful lately. Uh, and that's my question is what is more scary, the entire Chicago Bears team or the fact that the Vikings are called the Purple Pe- People Eaters? I just love that. I love the fact that the Purple People Eaters are playing on Halloween night. It's going to be great. They're going to completely demolish the Bears. And it's going to be another showcase game for the NFL that is unwatchable. <laughs> oh boy and that is something to look forward to i tell you uh no uh, i look at this as uh, another one of those games where you know chicago is going to try to hang in there with minnesota and they may to an extent um but i think minnesota is just too much and i just don't think that chicago can handle them so i mean cut and dry minnesota's gonna win we go to the Sunday night matchup. The Philadelphia Eagles coming in 4-2, and two, going into Dallas, or Arlington, sorry, to face Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott and the rest of the Cowboys. Uh, hey. <laughs> this is a hard one because I don't think, I still don't think the Cowboys have faced a defense like the one the Philadelphia Eagles present to them. I mean, this is a, you know, they're, they're not... Their the linebackers are going to get at you. They have a pass rush that's very dangerous. Yes, the Cowboys have that offensive line, and yes, every time you worry about them, Ezekiel just punches you in the mouth. You got to wor- You got to. You got to deal with that. But Dez is coming back. That's a plus. But I just. I just worry about is his offensive line going to be able to deal with the defensive line, and how is that going to react if he has lots and lots of pressure, uh, which. I don't think he's really, really faced a lot of yet. So, um, I'm going to take the Cowboys. I think it's going to be, like, really close. Like, one of those three-point games that you're, like, biting the nails. Uh, the way I look at it is this game is going to be exciting. Uh, both teams are going to look at this game as a almost a playoff type game because of the fact that this could hinge on who gets to be the leader of the NFC East. And, uh, you know, really Philadelphia could use this victory um, to springboard ahead because, you know, they, they have a loss to Washington and uh, they want to make sure that they don't start getting behind in these NFC East matchups. The way I look at this, though, is I think that you've got to respect Philadelphia's defense. It is good. I think the secondary may be their strongest point. Um, defensive line is okay. Looks like they're going to possibly be without uh, Benny Logan. And without him, that's a big problem. We saw what Washington did with Matt Jones. Now, we all know Matt Jones is one of the best running backs in the league, right? Right? I mean, right? Oh, quiet, silent. So that there goes proves my point. Uh, I would be terrified as an Eagles fan thinking that the leading rusher is going to come in and play my team when we're not really good right now at stopping the run. So that's the thing. I don't think it's about Dak. I don't think it's about Carson Wentz. I think it's about the running game, and I think Dallas is going to have the better running game. Is it going to be a blowout? Probably not. I think Dallas gets the victory here based on them just running the ball, taking all the time off the clock, and Carson Wentz being forced to throw the ball more than he wants to. Yeah, I'm still really interested. I'm not 100% sold, actually, on the Eagles' defense. You know, their stats have looked pretty good. And, yes, they completely disrupted Minnesota last week. But Minnesota was missing a few key offensive linemen, so I think that was also part of it. And as you guys have both said, Dallas has one of, if not the best, offensive line in the game, which will definitely help with the rookies in the backfield. I'm actually... Not going to say having Des Bryant backs, you know, a positive for this team right now. They've really been clicking without him. Um, and he, we all know Des Bryant. He is not one to to sit off to the side and watch everyone else have success without him. Uh, he wants to be a part of it. Well, you know, while he was out there, Prescott, for the most part, you know, ignored him and wasn't trying to force the ball to him. And that works while you're winning. 
and and so far Dallas has definitely been one of the best teams in the league. I just like the fact that Dallas is coming off a bye here, uh, a huge defense or divisional matchup to get that extra week to prepare and and watch tape and get things going, especially with a young team like this going up against another really young quarterback. I, I think that's all the extra stuff that you need in right now. And I'm going to take Dallas just for that fact. All right. Well, wow, we've all picked Dallas. So hopefully that curse doesn't normally happen here, <laughs> but uh, that's going to do it for us. Picking all the games. Uh, you know, we talked about everything here. Uh, did you want to say anything about the Josh Brown thing before we get out of here? Oh yeah. Listen, I listened to you guys' podcast on Tuesday at just cause I knew I was actually going to call in and, and the timing was wrong. I was going to surprise you guys, but it didn't quite work out the way I wanted, but I listened, listened back to it. And again, I agreed with most of the stuff you guys talked about with just the Josh Brown stuff. You guys hit on, on everything as far as that goes. And Josh Brown's a complete dirt, dirt bag. Um, the thing that drives me nuts and the thing that I, I completely disagreed with the two of you on was you both said that the Giants and the NFL handled it right. Uh, I completely disagree with that. Listen, yes, cutting him and putting him on the example list was the right thing to do, but it should have happened five weeks ago. Uh, the fact that they first gave him a one-game suspension after coming out with the Ray Rice rule and saying any domestic violence is a six-game suspension, no ifs, ands, or buts, unless you're a kicker and we try to hide it and nobody's going to pay attention. Then you'll get one game. And then, oh, oh wait, no, he, he admitted to doing awful, awful things and basically treating her like a slave. Oh, okay, now I guess we have to deal with stuff. It was just, it, to me, it proved that the NFL only did what they did to Ray Rice because of a video, because it became such a big thing because we saw Ray Rice hit his girlfriend and they knew that the backlash would be huge. So they made all these rules. Ray Rice has been completely abolished from the league, uh, but they thought they could just kind of hide this Josh Brown stuff. They didn't want any more bad publicity. They'll give him his one game suspension and act like, you know, nothing big ever happened. They knew all of this stuff. He confessed to all of it. They tried to hide it under the rug, and it didn't work. So th- the fact that, that you guys said that they did everything right, is, I, it's just, it's a mess. The NFL is a mess with with everything that's going on, you know, with their ratings going down and all this other stuff. So I honestly think it was just them trying to, to hide it. Who cares about a kicker at, in that way? But what Josh Brown admitted to doing was, to me, 30,000 times worse than what Ray Rice did and what Ray Rice did was you know unexcusable by any means and I don't think he should have ever been back in the league and I don't think Josh Brown should be back either yeah well I'll say this when, you know, so I, when they first suspended him though did they know about him admitting to that stuff they say no but The NFL does do their own investigating before they go and do their suspensions. I personally think they knew at least part of it. But even then, their rule was any domestic violence, six games. Right, but you have to have actual proof that it happened. You can't just say, oh, well, maybe, because how many many of these women come in and – I'm not saying women, men. No, no, I agree. How many of these women do this he said, she said crap and, you know – I'm just saying you have to have actual proof that it happened, and that's why he got the one game. But you shouldn't have given him one game. If you're still unsure and you're going through the policy, you don't give him the one game. Yeah, I I mean, the worst thing, too, is that apparently she called the NFL, and then, you know, they didn't, like, do anything, or I don't know what that was. Like, she says she called and said something about it, and, like, I guess they just didn't respond to her or, or whatever. But it's like, you know, that's that's, that's bad on them as well. If, you know, she's telling you that, hey, he hit me or whatever, you probably should at least look into it. But, you know. I, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, it's an issue. It's a big problem. And I, I agree with Randy. 
on the aspect of these type of things should not be tolerated and you know they should get on these things quicker uh, it, the problem is is the NFL has the ball of proof and you know it, it's just that's it's it's a slippery slope it's so hard I think the NFL is a little bit backwards on their policies anyway I really really do you know they don't like you taking certain fat burners or different things blah 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 and guys get suspended four games ten games for that and then situations like this they get a game for injuring a innocent person that's it's messed up it's backwards uh, I look at this as they need to reevaluate and really really consider what their image is going to be you know the rating situation is not looking good you know they're losing ratings which is kind of odd for the NFL you start putting other things in like politics into your game, you're going to have a lot more ratings lost. So they need to reevaluate. Yeah. Stop showing. Can we go back to like the national anthem wasn't played before every single game? Like, why do we have to see who sits down and who kneels and who whatever? It's like, who cares? Just stop. I get, look, I get they're trying to send a message and whatever, but people don't want that stuff shoved in their face. It was fine for the first like couple weeks and and whatever, but it was like every single local news story was, oh well, the players for our team, which ones sat down, which ones kneeled, which ones whatever. Then you get stories of like certain players got released because they did that, and it was like. You've got to be kidding me. Like, just, it was, it's been everywhere. It's been a storyline of this season that doesn't need to be a storyline. Like, it takes away focus from the on field play. And again, Rich. I get their. Tr- Rich. I was just going to say, Rich, be honest, the on field play has not been <laughs> superb. No, it hasn't been good. Season. And that's part of the reason why the Rangers are down, too. But it's just. If they're saying the number one re- – I don't know if this is the NFL or some – I think it was some kind of research people did that the number one reason the Rangers are down is because the the constant thing with the National Anthem and reminding people that, oh, this person kneeled, this person sat down. It's like, okay, enough. You know, I get them because I, I just – I wait till the game starts sometimes now because it's just, I don't want to deal with having to hear half the beginning of the broadcast is that. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you it's feel about it, Gary, but it's just it's annoying. No, I, I I agree. They they should have already started slipping away from that a long time ago. Uh, you know, after that first game, stop stop showing it. Stop worrying about it. Focus on the game. And I get it. It's a ratings grabber, and it's not because it's not the ratings aren't there. But they think it's a ratings grabber. You know, one of those whole things controversy creates cash that's not working sorry nfl you should have stopped this a long time ago and especially because it's like we're already in a political climate as it is we're already got to deal with the election year and all the other crap like you I mean you know they don't need more of it you go to sports to escape you don't go to sports to hear more politics exactly yeah you know, and then some of the announcers would get on their agendas and whatever, and it's like nobody is watching this TV uh, station to hear what you have to say about politics. Just shut up. You know, just, but, uh, you know, the NFL is going to do what they do because they think they're untouchable, and perhaps this thing with the ratings shows them that they aren't. You know, and then they they need to focus back on what makes things important. So, uh, well, that'll do it for us here on uh, football to the max for today. We'll be back on Tuesday, of course, recapping the rest of the games and everything. And until then, see everybody later.